Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God. Our sin and our debt overcoming. Jesus. Here is our king, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now, we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us. The bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday.
majesty the father's will complete he reigns in victory sing hallelujah to the king he is worthy to receive all the worship we can bring what he's done what he's done all the glory sacrifice you gave for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, welcome everyone to our Good Friday service. If this is your first time at our church or at any church, you might be thinking, what is going on? <laughs> Today is the day that we come and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. We, we think of the story of how Jesus, in the midst of everything he, he's on the scene, he's with his disciples, he's with his friends, and he knows he's going to the cross. He knows that the world is going to kill him because of who he is. And in the midst of all of this, it seems like everyone seems to fail him. When he knows he's going to go on that cross, his friends won't even stay awake with him to pray. They seem to fall asleep. Peter, really overzealous, cuts that guy's ear off. It seems like everyone's not on the right page except for Jesus. And yet Jesus marches one foot after another, knowing exactly the kind of pain that would come. Today is the day that we remember the sacrifice he made, the excruciating pain he went through, the sacrifice he made. We remember the blood. We remember the nails. We remember all of it. We remember it as good because of what it means for us that God pays for all of our sins to atone, to make us right with God, that all of the sin of the world is swallowed up here, and that Jesus defeats death by going to the grave here. So with all that being said, we're gonna spend a time this evening where we remember, we, we read through the story and we read through what happened there but we remember it as good because we believe the words he says at the end there where he says, it is finished. Knowing what comes Sunday, we know today it is finished. Tonight as part of, uh, of our service, we are going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, celebrate communion. And uh, how we will do that is in just a moment, the worship team is going to lead in a song. And while, while uh, we're singing this song, I'm going to ask that you come up to the, uh, the table in front and gather the elements for the Lord's Supper, just like we normally do in our church. And so tonight, however, just gather the elements and then take it back to your seat and wait there. And as... Uh, BC is going to read a scripture in just a moment. And we're going to start because this is where we start in this, in this story of Good Friday is we're going to start with the Last Supper. And so as we read through the Last Supper, 
we will take the elements together. And so just be ready, have the bread ready, be ready with the cup, and we will take those elements together as BC reads the scripture. And I'll, and I'll give you a cue as to when we're going to do that. Everybody with me? All right. Go ahead and let's stand together, and we're going to sing the song. we sing. Luke 22, verses 7 through 20, the scripture says this, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations to eat the Passover. Where do, we want, where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher ask, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying 
this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which I poured out for you. Let's take the cup together. Matthew 27, 27 through 31, it says this. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put him in a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it upon his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt before him and mocked him. Hail the king of Jews, they said. They spit on him. They took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes. Then they led him away to crucify him. Just as I am, you welcome me. With all
John 19, 16, 22. It says, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side of Jesus, he in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, Many of the Jews read the sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priest of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What, have I, what I have written, I have written.
stone was moved for good, for the Lamb it conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, there the Spirit lit the flame. Now we've got the truth of all, shall I need it, shall I fail? By His blood, in His grace, in His freedom, I am free. John 19, 28 through 30, it says here, Later, knowing that everything had been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Nineteen seventy. You know, I don't want to think that that's so long ago, but I guess it is, right? <laughs> In 1970, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel gave to the world a song about a poor boy who moves to New York City on a dream, on a whim, and essentially becomes a victim of the big city's harsh life. He has no money, he has no friends, no job, and he spends his days, as the song says, laying low, seeking out the poorer quarters where the ragged people go looking for the places only they would know. It seems like we've seen this guy before, right? It's easy to picture him in your mind. He probably needs a bath. He's got a ragged beard, dirty face, dirty hands, worn out clothes. He really wants to find work, but he can't seem to get hired anywhere. He trudges along the sidewalks with, with other people, thousands of other people, strangers. And he battles that cold that seems to settle in your bones, dreaming of going someplace where the New York City winters aren't bleeding me, leading me home. I mean, it's pretty understandable that he thinks about giving up, right? Quitting going home. It's not something that he ever thought he'd do, ever. But, I mean, come on, don't sugarcoat it. Look at what reality is. 
And just when he, he, you know, metaphorically picks up the towel to throw it in the ring, he encounters a boxer. And maybe some of you older folks, do you remember these words? In the clearing stands a boxer and a fighter by his trade, and he carries a reminder of every blow that laid him out or cut him till he cries out in his anger and his pain, I am leaving, I am leaving. But the fighter still remains. But the fighter still remains. There's something kind of magnetic about that phrase. There's a kind of truthfulness to it. Draws us in. Those who can remain, you know, like that boxer, are rare indeed. And listen, I'm not talking about the victors. I'm not talking about those who win. I just mean to finish, to remain, to stick with it until you're done. You know, unfortunately, there are very few of us who do that. Our tendency, as often unreliable human beings, is to quit too soon. Oftentimes, we stop before we reach the finish line. And this tendency is seen in the smallest things, you know. I didn't quite finish the yard work. I only got halfway through that book. I started that letter or that email. I didn't finish it. I started that 2024 resolution to lose weight. Where are we now? Maybe we have a car that doesn't run. (laughs) It's been sitting in your driveway for months or even years waiting to be fixed up. And sometimes it shows up in some of life's most painful areas. You know, an an abandoned child. An abandoned or cold or empty faith. Going from job to job, hoping for something more, hoping for something better. A wrecked marriage. Understanding in our minds that the world needs to know Jesus, but never saying a word. I don't necessarily mean to touch anything painful in your life, but I might be. I mean, is there any chance at all that that right here, tonight, I'm addressing anyone who is considering giving up? If I am, I want to encourage you to remain. I want to encourage you to remember the steadfastness and determination of Jesus on that cross. Jesus didn't quit. And don't think for a moment that he wasn't tempted to. I mean, read the story. Watch him shake his head as he hears his disciples quarrel and discuss about who's the greatest, man. Look at him break down as he weeps at Lazarus' tomb. Look at him (laughs) wail, claw the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prays. He's looking for a way out, man. He doesn't want to suffer. Did you ever want to quit? (laughs) Of course you did, right? We all have at some point or another. That's why one of Jesus' final words, you know, the one that we read just a moment ago, is so incredible, it's so massive, it's so glorious. It is finished. I mean, close your eyes. Close your eyes and listen to that word again. It is finished. Can you imagine hearing that cry from the cross? The sky is dark. There's a sort of quiet around these these three men on the crosses. You know, maybe the jeering mouths have fallen still now. Maybe there's thunder. Maybe there's weeping. Maybe there's just a a simple silence. And then Jesus pushes his feet down on that Roman nail 
and he draws in a deep breath and cries out, it is finished. What was finished? The plan of redeeming human beings was finished. The message of God to people was finished. The works done by Jesus as a man was finished. This task of selecting and training his disciples was finished. His job was finished. The song is over. The blood's been poured. The sacrifice made. The sting of death has been removed. It was over. So was that a cry of defeat? (laughs) Hardly. I'd imagine that if his hands weren't spiked to this cross, that he'd have raised a triumphant fist and punched the air. There was no cry of despair, but a shout of completion, victory, fulfillment, even perhaps a cry of relief. The fighter remained. Thank God, right? Thank God he endured. Are you close to quitting? Don't do it. Are you discouraged as a parent? Man, hang in there. Hang in there. Are you tired of simply doing good and feeling like you're getting treated like some sort of doormat? Do good. Man, you're not responsible for other people's reactions, just yours. Are you pessimistic about your job or about school? Man, roll up your sleeves and get back in there. No communication in your marriage? Give it another shot and maybe get some help. You can't resist temptation? Accept God's forgiveness and then make a change in how you've acted from the past and go for one more round, man. Is your day filled with sorrow and anxiety and disappointment? Are your tomorrows turning into nevers? Is hope a word that has lost its meaning in your life? Is it a word that kind of laughs at you? Remember, a finisher is not someone who has no wounds or weakness or, or weariness. No, no. A finisher is someone like the boxer. He's scarred, bloody, but still there. Mother Teresa once said, God didn't call us to be successful, just faithful. The fighter, you know, like Jesus, is pierced and full of pain. He could have even been like Paul, bound and beaten, but he still remains. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, awaits those who endure. It's not just for those who hit the tape first, It's not just for those who get to drive the victory laps or those who drink the champagne, right? Not even. It's for those who endure to the end. So friends, friends, let's endure. Let's endure. I want us to marinate for a moment in some scriptures designed to give us staying power. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive 
the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So we say, thank you, Paul Simon. Thank you, Apostle Paul. Thank you, James. Thank you to the writer of Hebrews. But most of all, thank you, Jesus, for ascending Calvary's hill and being more than enough for each of us, teaching us to remain, to endure, and in the end, to finish. Resolve to know nothing but you crucified. Somehow in this room right now, it is enough. The weight of the world, too much for the souls of men. But somehow you hold it all upon the cross. Dear God, uh, we thank you for sending your one and only son to come and die for us. God, we thank you that we get to gather together to remember the sacrifice you made. God, I pray um, that as solemn our remembering is, so much more our rejoicing will be come Sunday. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I I hope that... um, 
again, remembering is kind of a key word here. I, I, I pray that as today becomes a day of remembering, um, you know, we would leave with that sense of remembering as well. Um, that every year as Good Friday comes, we would be able to pause like this. Um, as we dismiss, I just want to remind you of, you know, tomorrow's Easter egg hunt uh, for the kids. It's going to be great. Um, if you're a volunteer, please be here at 9 a.m. sharp. Otherwise, 10 a.m. is when our Easter egg hunt starts. We do have a backup plan in case of rain, so don't fret. Uh, we will do things indoors if it is raining. Otherwise, we will be out there hunting eggs. <laughs> uh, this Sunday is our Easter service. Um, everyone's been inviting lots of friends. I've been inviting my friends. Uh, I'm excited to come and celebrate with each one of you this Sunday. You guys have a great weekend. We love you. We will see you very soon.